Well, good to see everybody today. I'm glad you're here. And um, hey, uh, before I get into the message, I just think it's important, you know, growing up back in New Jersey as a kid and going into New York City, you know, probably once a month or so, going up into the World Trade Center with my dad numerous times as a kid. I mean, this time of, uh, of year, particularly because it's Sunday while it's September 11th, I just think it's important to just pause for a moment. And it's not that we want to perpetually relive a bad moment. It's not really so much about that. Yes, we want to honor that um, there was life lost. But what I also want to do is think about something. I I just remember that on on that day, we saw what felt like a surge of a bit of revival in in our country. On the heels of something that was horrific, there was an amazing way that a whole lot of our nation kind of came together. And I want to take advantage of this moment today of remembering 9-11 by, by specifically remembering that aspect of it. The way so many of us decided, you know what? This is making things real clear, that this and this can stay on the sidelines because we really need to come together. And I'm kind of hoping and praying that in some ways that something like that could still happen. And then maybe remembering uh, that 9-11 a lot, of, a lot of years ago could prompt us to, to kind of lay hold of, hey, as we come into a, what could be a dicey you know, political season or whatever, maybe we could grab hold of that heartbeat that, uh, that it evidenced on, on 9-11 and say, man, let's grab hold of that again. So I just wanted to pause for a moment. And uh, if you would, would you pray with me just uh, as, a, as a body of Christ? And God, we do remember something that was absolutely horrific on 9-11, and, and we do honor the, the lives that were lost. Uh, and at the same time, though, God, I thank you that on the heels of something horrific, that somehow a whole bunch of, uh, of us, as a whole bunch of different kinds of people, found a way to say, man, what really matters is coming together. And so, Lord, I pray that you would allow us to still be those kinds of people, even, uh, even in the, the days that we're living in now. So Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us through your word, and I pray in Jesus' name, and everybody say it together, amen, amen, amen. All right, well, uh, we're gonna be wrapping up Inside Out series on Romans chapter 12, so you can open up your Bible and make your way there. Um, this past week, I, I became aware, maybe it was a week and a half ago, I became aware of, of a song that I never knew that I would need to forget as quickly as I could. <laughs> and so what happened was I was in the kitchen, and all of a sudden I heard, um, I heard my wife singing something like, it's corn, na, 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 na. and I was like, oh, what's that song? And she was like, oh, nothing, nothing, never mind, never mind. It's just this dumb song that I can't get out of my head. And, um, and then all of a sudden I needed to know, what is this thing? And so I looked it up, and then I became aware of what many of you have already discovered over the last couple of weeks. This, there's this little kid named Tarek up in South Dakota, and, you know, he's just a nice little kid, and somebody interviewed him uh, about, you know, what they grow in South Dakota, which was a lot of corn, and, and what he thought about it. And then somebody else took that interview and took Tarek's words and put it to an auto-tune thing with a keyboard and a beat and made a song out of it. And then within minutes, the algorithms on YouTube and, and TikTok made it viral, and, uh, and all of a sudden, hundreds of thousands of us all around the country find ourselves singing, and I got to read the words, because. but he says, it's corn, a big lump with knobs, it has the juice. <laughs> Can't imagine more beautiful thing. Oh, it's corn. Yeah, I can tell you all about it, and when I put butter on it, everything changed, or something like that. I can't even do it justice. It's just, it's too high of a bar to reach, you know? Anyway, it, this little kid, it's kind of cute until you heard it for like the 11th time, and then you're infected with it, and you don't know what to do to get rid of it. Uh, this kid, though, instantly, I mean, instantly, by the end of that week, he had a TikTok channel with almost half a million followers on it, and then the governor of the state of South Dakota, 
issued a state plot proclamation that this kid is now the uh, corn ambassador, and, and then and he can be the, the corn boy from the state of, state of South Dakota. And, and, and then other people started like doing remixes and like, covers of the song. Like there's a punk rock version of its corn. There's a R&B gospel version of its corn. Then Kevin Bacon didn't want to keep six degrees of separation. He got right on it. He did an acoustic folk version sitting on the beach singing its corn. I mean, it's kind of crazy, right? Crazy. Crazy. And I'm feeling for this kid, Tarek, because, I mean, he just woke up one day and got interviewed. That's all. And now all of a sudden, what he is known for is being the corn ambassador. And I have a feeling, because he seems like a smart kid, like one day he's going to be like a molecular biological engineer or something, doing amazing things. But people are going to be like, hey, you're that corn guy, aren't you? You're that corn boy. He's going to always be wondering, mom, why? Like, why is this what I'm known for? Anyway, what are you known for? What are you known for? I I want you to consider that question a little bit today. What are you known for? What what would be said about you? What are you known for? And if you're a follower of Jesus, is what you're known for anything like Jesus and what he was known for? And I want that kind of to be on our minds together as we're getting ready to turn to Romans chapter 12. Like, what, are, what am I known for? And is what I'm known for anything like what Jesus was known for? And we think about Jesus and what he was known for. I mean, he's known for casting out demons. He's known for bringing healing touch, like left and right, just healing people who are sick, the lepers and the blind and the deaf. And I mean, he, he was healing people. And uh, for a lot of people, even to this day, even people who aren't Christians per se, He's known for his teaching, especially the teaching that's in the Sermon on the Mount. And a lot of us are familiar with the words there in the Sermon on the Mount. It's where Jesus is saying in Matthew 5, blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. And blessed are those who are meek. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are the merciful, they will be shown mercy. Those words, right? And when you hear those words in the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, isn't something inside of you kind of proud to be a Jesus follower, right? Like, my Jesus, he said those things. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm proud to know that, that the one I follow, Jesus, he said those words. And, and you know, I, I think about those words, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. Something inside of me wants to say, you know what, I'm, I'm really grateful for them, those wonderful, magical people out there that are peacemakers. I like what you said there, Jesus, about them. Glad you got some people like that somewhere. <laughs> they must be really special. Those, those ones who mourn with those who mourn? Yeah. And, and in a sense, what I want to do is keep the focus on anyone other than me. <laughs> I like how it's phrased. Blessed are the, uh, the meek. They shall inherit the earth. But Jesus doesn't leave it with the they. Jesus pretty quickly turns in the Sermon on the Mount and says, oh, yeah, I know what you're doing. You're trying to think, yeah, good, good thing there's other people like that. But Jesus says, no, it's about you. And what comes next after the Beatitudes is Jesus saying, it's Jesus saying, you, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, what are we going to do? It's just going to be worthless, going to get trampled on. And, and he's looking at, at you and me, I believe. And through all eternity, even though his words were spoken 2,000 years ago, he's still looking at you saying, it's you. You're the salt of the earth, and you're the light of the world. And, and you, your light, no one puts a light under a bushel and hides it. The light is placed where it can shine. And so in Matthew 5, 16, right in the middle of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, he says, so let, let your light shine before all men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus is saying, look, if you've really given your life to me, I've begun a deep work inside of you, and I'm transforming you, and you're not just the same old you you used to be. You got something powerful going on on the inside of you, and I want it to begin to be revealed on the outside like never before. Jesus is still looking at you and me, any one of us who have put our trust in him, saying, where are you? Where's your light? Where's it shining? Let it be bright. Y'all are real quiet. I don't know why. This is a good word right now. It's a good word. It, it could get a little heavier in about 10 minutes, so you might as well say amen now while it's a little bit on the happy end of the spectrum. <laughs> But Jesus is looking at you and saying, what do you want to be known for? What are you known for? And then we get over to Romans chapter 12. And what I, what, what I feel when I'm reading it is, is that 
It's as though Holy Spirit, who inspired the words of Paul, is saying, listen, remember those words of Jesus, Sermon on the Mount types of words? That's not just like a it's corn type of song where you want to try to get it out of your head as quick as you can. No, that's actually something that you need to have in your, in your mind, and it needs to sink into your heart and then come through your life. J- Jesus is looking at you and me, and he knows what he's done for us. He knows that he has, if we've put our trust in him, that he has given us the gift of the forgiveness of our sins, and he's given us the power of his spirit living within us so that we can live a different kind of a life. And so we get to Romans chapter 12, hopefully you've turned there by now, and uh, we, we catch a bit of the resonance of the heart of Jesus coming through, even in Romans 12, in a surprising kind of way. And this is what it says there, in Romans 12, verse 14, it says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Wow. Woo, that's a lot. You can clap for God's word if you want to, but it's a lot. Thank you, Jesus, but it's a lot. (laughs) It's a lot. Right? I mean, I took the time to, after reading through this, to say, wait, hold a minute, that's a lot, to count through them. And and there's 16, 16 actions (laughs) that, that if you hear it this way, that God is calling for, for everybody who's a believer. 16, 16, that's a whole lot. When I find myself reading a part of the Bible like the part we just read, where there's 16 things coming at me, something inside of me feels a little overwhelmed. I feel a little bit like, how, how, how am I... How am I going to keep up with all that? How am I going to actually do all of that? And I think it's okay to say so, but I think it's important when we come to a passage of scripture like this that's laying on a, a lot to remember the backdrop. And the backdrop is, if you remember from three weeks ago, I'm grounded in grace. And so I come to what, what's presented here today, and I remind myself, well, I'm grounded in grace. The grace of God has carried me every single day of my life and is never going to drop me. And, and so if I am able to hit all 16 of these all the time, great. Glory to God. And miracles may happen, right? And if I miss one of these or two or three of these, then glory to God that his grace has been my foundation and will continue to be. Right? Amen? That, that there's a covering for me. And so I can, I can receive these 16 things with a kind of, a, I can let myself pressure down a little bit. And I can say, yes, God, yes to all of these 16 things that you're calling them for. But what helps me personally is when I find myself looking at a list of things in the Bible that God's calling me to, is to simply say, Holy Spirit, is there maybe one of these things that you want me to focus on today? Because I don't know if I can do, I can't really even remember all 16 of them, let alone do them all. (laughs) So that's a fair way to proceed. I recommend it to you. And maybe over the next 15 minutes while you're listening to this message, you can be kind of asking that question, having an internal dialogue with the Holy Spirit saying, Holy Spirit, out of all of these things, is there maybe one that you would call my attention to today? Does that sound fair? Do you think you might be able to do that? What I'm giving you permission to do is to zone off in the next 15 minutes, and I won't feel bad about it. I might call you back a bit, but, but ask God to show you maybe one of these 16 that you could be drawn to uh, asking for his help with. But I want to I wanna go back to the, the last verse that we read, because it's something like a, a key to the rest. It said in verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I want you to read that with me from the screen, nice and strong, ready to go. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. One more time, say it good. 
Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome the evil with good. Hold on a second. This is the Bible, and this is a, the book of Romans is written to who? Who's it written to? It's written to, to us, to, to, to Christians, to the Christians in Rome. It's, an, it's a word from the Holy Spirit written to a, a group of Christians. Now, let me ask you this question. Why would a nice group of good, wonderful Christians need to be told, don't over, be overcome by evil. Because a group of nice, good, wonderful Christians can be overcome by evil. It can happen. But more to the point, what about me personally? What about you personally? And I think it's important that we do take it personally. We let God's word get up in our grill a little bit, and it's as though God is saying to you and me personally, hey, don't be overcome by evil. And it reminds me that Jesus told me to pray and to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and, and forgive my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass, tra trespass, trespass against me, and lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from I mean, Jesus even said, hey, every day you ought to kind of pray, deliver me from evil. Why? Because Jesus is also aware that I could actually be overcome by evil. I, and I, I mean, this is not meant to be scary in any way. It's just matter of fact. But how could it happen? How could a, how could a, a, a group of good, wonderful Christian people get overcome by evil? Or how could any one individual of us find ourselves getting overcome by evil? How does that happen? I think it happens because we don't see evil for what it is. And maybe we think about evil and we think, well, evil, I mean, that's going to show up like the devil with a, you know, a red velvet suit and a little tail and a pointed goatee and a pitchfork saying, ha, ha, I'm evil. <laughs> that's not usually how it happens. You like that? Like my impersonation of the devil? Is a <laughs> it's not really how evil tends to show up. Uh, I'm aware that we can probably, at least a lot of us, point to evil somewhere else in the world, but I think there's a spiritual art that we get to grow in, which is to, to see evil for what it is, which is a force of destruction sent from hell itself. And part of what I want to grow in doing is recognizing evil when it's manifesting, when it's showing up. And then internally determining not to partner with it. And it's an art. It's an art. And there's gradient to this. It's less off and on. It's sometimes, Holy Spirit, help me to understand what's actually happening here. And the word of God is do not be overcome by evil. But overcome evil with good. What, is, what does evil really look like? When I was reading through Romans uh, 12, verses 14, 15, 16, on one hand, it's, it's, a, it's actions that we're called to. But on the other hand, if you trace through it, what you see is what evil can look like. I know it sounds a little weird, but I want you to see it this way with me. Like, for example, the, the first part said, bless and do not curse. And, and in a sense, that, that propensity to curse, that's evil. Are you with me? And so as those words continued, I, I find what evil looks like kind of being described in, in verse. So uh, cursing is a kind of an evil. Cold-hearted lack of empathy, not willing to mourn with those who mourn. That's evil. Discord and, and strife, not living in harmony with one another. That's evil. Uh, arrogance and pride, where it said don't be conceited. That arrogance and pride is a kind of an evil that can overcome. Or where it says do right in the eyes of everyone. And maybe I just don't. And it's it's sinful behavior in public, like that's the evil, and, and not being at peace with others, that, that bitterness, that's a kind of an evil. And when I read these things, when I describe evil that way, some of us ought to go, man, if that happens, that ain't right. Somebody join me and quote Chris Rock from Head of State and say, that ain't right. 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 Especially when that kind of stuff is coming through the life of a person who knows and loves Jesus. Come on, say, that ain't right. <laughs> and, and if I'm going to be a part of, of the Holy Spirit's solution, what I want to do is actually live the love of God in a, in a more profound way. 
What we're reading right now in verses 14 and following, I believe it really kind of comes through from, from, from verse 9. And if you remember last week at verse 9, it said, really love one another. Or in another translation, it says, your, your love for one another must be sincere. And then everything that comes after that sentence is, is an outworking of what that love is meant to look like. And so in this section that we're reading today, it's more of the flow of God's love and what it's meant to look like. I believe that, that the Holy Spirit's ultimate strategy for the overcoming of the evil has to do with our ability to be conduits of God's good love. And I'm praying that you and I would say, if that's God's solution, sign me up to be a part of it. And so I want to go back to the verse again, verse 14, and trace through it a little bit more. In verse 14, it said, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but... Be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do you see how everything that we just read, it is what not being overcome by evil, but instead overcoming evil with good looks like? It looks like that. It looks like everything we just read. And one of the phrases that, that, I, that I recognize here that jumps out at me is, 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 is blessing. But, but the context in all of these moments is is grittiness. You know, let, me, let me show you what I mean. Grittiness. Like the grittiness of those moments where there's, there's somebody who I'm just angry at and I just want in my flesh. I just want to curse them. Yeah. But in that grittiness, there's an opportunity for the opposite, for the goodness of God to come, the love of God to come in goodness right in that very gritty moment. There's the grittiness of, of, of when, when somebody is rejoicing because they just you know, got the new job, or somebody's mourning because their father just died. Like those situations where uh, something inside of me may, may, may want to come alongside of them, but something else inside of me wants to just check out and say, I really don't care. It's not my problem, and I didn't get the job, and well, my dad died too, and just detach and be aloof. But instead, right in that grittiness, I feel the grittiness. And it's an opportunity for the goodness of God to be manifest, yeah. overcome evil with good. And so I step in with, the, I'm going to mourn with those who mourn. I'm going to rejoice with those who rejoice. And, and I find myself in moment after moment with an opportunity to engage in that grittiness with the good love of God. Amen. And that's really my message today in a nutshell. It's a resolve because Jesus has transformed me. Because Jesus has forgiven my sin and said, I am born again. There's something new at work within me. And it's the capacity to be a conduit for that good love of God. Amen. And to not be passive and to not be aloof and to not figure it's somebody else. They, those peacemakers, they're the one. No. To be the one who says, I know who my Savior is. I know what he's done in my life and is doing in my life. And therefore, I get to be a conduit and I want to be. Right in the middle of that grittiness, right where it's gritty and, and kind of difficult, that's your opportunity, church, to, to step in and bring the goodness of God. But do you have that resolve? And can you step up that resolve to say, this is who I'm going to be. I'm going to be a person who engages in the grittiness with the good love of God. Look in the gritty moments. And you'll see it. It's a chance. It's a chance for you to show up, a chance for you to be present, a chance for you to bring the good love of God. And so this is the challenge, to embrace this resolve. I'll engage in the grittiness of God's good love. I'll engage in the grittiness of God's good love. OK, now I stopped at verse 21, but I want to actually go back to verse 14 again. It said, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Why don't you read that verse with me? Ready, go. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Bless and do not curse. This is like one of those fundamental operating principles of the kingdom of God. It really is. The principle of blessing. Let me remind you of who you are. When you go back in the scriptures starting from the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. 
You find God choosing one particular man, one particular person to elevate. This is Abraham. And out of all the people on the earth, and we'll never know why, but why there in that part of the globe rather than this one or another one, but God chose Abraham. He had to choose somebody. He chose Abraham. And he said, Abraham, I'm going to bless the heck out of you. He didn't say it quite like that, but he said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elevate you. I'm going to give you descendants as much as the stars in the sky, the grains of sand on the beach. I'm going to bless you, Abraham. But I want you to know this. As I bless you, Abraham, you are blessed to be a blessing. And then in Romans 9, and then in the book of Hebrews again and again, you and I, as believers in Jesus, we are described as the seed of Abraham, like the people in the lineage of Abraham, meaning you and I are meant to be those who understand who we are on this earth, part of the people God has chosen by his own goodness and mercy to bless and to bless good. And I want you to recognize you've been blessed good. <laughs> you've been blessed real good. Snap, snap it to spiritual attention for just a second. And let me tell you how blessed you've been. You are so blessed. You're so blessed that all of your sin has been washed away and swept into the cross of Jesus Christ, paid for in full. You are so blessed, blessed because you've been given the gift of salvation. And you know that you are going to heaven when you die. You do not stand the threat of hell because Jesus has opened the door for all eternity for you to heaven. You are so blessed because you have been given the spirit of God to dwell inside of you. You are so blessed because you are walking hand in hand with Jesus wherever you go. You are so blessed because you get to keep in step with the Spirit of God. You are so blessed because you're filled with the Holy Spirit, able to live in his power and goodness. You are so blessed because you are called the light of the world by Jesus Christ himself. You're so blessed. I want you to just put your hand on your heart and say, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. Man, sometimes you got to just say it like it is. I'm so blessed. <laughs> I'm so blessed. Oh, yeah, I've got some problems. Yeah, I've got some challenges. Yes, I've got some difficulties with my health or whatever else. I don't care. I'm so blessed. <laughs> I'm so blessed. You, you and I must develop a discipline of right-sizing our perspective, recalibrating around the truth, and it is that I am blessed. And I'm blessed to be a blessing. This is my lineage. This is my inheritance in Abraham. It's who I am. It's who you are. And even if you're new, because you just recently raised your hand and said, I, I, yes, Jesus, yes, you were made brand new, and you were made part of the lineage of Abraham, blessed to be a blessing. It's who you are. It's who you are. And his word to you is bless and do not curse. 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 <laughs> a, few, a, few, a few years ago, there was a situation I was dealing with that resulted in um, this, 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 this person that uh, was creating a lot of strife for me, you know, uh, speaking a lot of accusations and slander and that kind of thing. And it was really painful for me. And I really did not like this person. And I didn't like him, and I heard some stuff one day again, and it just stirred it up, and I was so mad, and I was driving around town here and thinking about that situation, that person, and I just, I just I felt so mad and angry, and I was alone in the privacy of my own car, and so all of a sudden, I just started busting out, cussing the, about this guy. Did I just tell you that? Yes, I did. I, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll hand in my halo card right now. You can have I just busted out cussing at this guy in, in my car, in private. And, and, and then as the, you know, I'm, I'm like hitting the gas pedal, speeding, cussing. It was not a good scene. Like, you wouldn't have been like, hey, there's Pastor John. You'd been like, who's this crazy person? Anyway, I was, you know, cussing in my car, speeding up, being angry. And, and I, I felt like a reminder from, from the Holy Spirit, the words of Jesus. Pray for those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse. Bing, ding, ding. I'm grateful that sometimes we get conviction. And so I, I let my foot off the gas pedal. <laughs> Simmered down, and then I said, forgive me, Jesus, for cursing this, this guy, this person. Forgive me. 
And I felt like there was this little interchange between me and Jesus. And I felt like Jesus was responding to me saying, well, yeah, sure, I forgive you. You're forgiven. But that's not what I asked you to do. To simply say, forgive me for cursing this guy. That's not what I actually asked you to do. Like Jesus was reminding me, no, I, I asked you to bless and not curse. So then I had this like, idea, and I just did it r- real quick. And, and what I did, I knew where the, this person lived. So I, I drove around to where their house was, and I drove uh, down that street, and I put out my hand like this, and I went, I bless you, I bless you, I bless you, I bless you. <laughs> Done. Did it. Blessed them. Blessed them. <laughs> yeah, not so much. I felt convicted. Like, OK, that was a good start. And then, actually, what, what ended up happening was, you know, several times a week, for several weeks, I just, by obedience, drive by. It wasn't ready yet for a face-to-face kind of a thing. But this is what I could do, and it slowed down instead of speeding by. And then got real specific. God, I bless them with provision. I bless them with comfort. I bless them with healing. I bless them with help from heaven. I bless them with friendships. I bless them with good opportunities. I bless them with a hope for the future. I bless them with happiness as a family together. I bless them, and just on and on and on. And, and you, you know what? As I blessed them, I got better. As I blessed them, the brokenness inside of me got mended. As I blessed them, the darkness began to shift. And what ultimately ended up happening was it was a while down the road, but then there was a moment of coming face to face, mutually with tears in our eyes and love, and an opportunity for real reconciliation. But I think it had everything to do, it doesn't always happen that way, but I believe it had everything to do with this moment of shifting from cursing to blessing. And I think he really means it. And so I'm wondering, who is that person in your life who did you wrong, who hurts you, persecutes you maybe even, I don't know. And do you think you could imagine yourself doing what Jesus has called for and what Holy Spirit through Paul here in Romans 12 is asked for, to bless, to bless. And maybe like me, you're not ready for an inter, interpersonal, you know, face-to-face, but you can at least in, in the privacy of your own moment begin to shift your own atmosphere. I bless, I bless. The power for your healing may lie in your own choice to bless rather than curse. And take note of what God's word says. Leave room for my wrath. And he has wrath. And he does wrath way better than you ever could. He says, leave room for my wrath. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. But you know who he's going to repay? He's going to repay you. The word is recompense in, in an older tra- translation. It's like God saying, I will recompensate you for all of this trouble, trial that has happened. Do you believe he has the ability to do that? I do. I do. Here's what I know. I I know that I want to engage the grittiness of God's good love. And I want to do that because I know that he's engaged in the grittiness of my life with his love first. And and this is where I'm going to wrap things up. Ephesians 2, 4, it says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were, talk about grittiness, even when we were, say it, dead in transgression. Say it, the next part nice and strong. It is by grace I have been saved. Say, Say it personal like that. It is by grace I have been saved. One more time, say it. It is by grace I have been saved. Grace, like God got right down into the grittiness of my sin and my transgression, and he dealt with it. He took it. He lifted it from me. 
He lifted it from me and took it to the cross and paid for it and said, you don't owe for it anymore. I've paid the bill for you. You are covered by my mercy. That's how good his goodness is, right into the gritty stuff of me and you in our life when he says, you were dead in your transgressions. And from time to time, I want to zoom out on my own life and remember how that was, being dead in my transgressions, and to thank him for his goodness in my life, that it is by grace that I'm saved. Every once in a while, I want to remind myself of this fundamental truth. It's by grace that I'm saved. Lest I look at those 16 things and think, oh, now I got to do this one, and what if I miss that one, and what about the other? The pressure's off, my friends. You, you have been saved by grace. And then that grace gives you an empowerment internally to begin to live into those 16 things and however many else you might find throughout God's word. But it's by grace. Would you just say that one more time? It is by grace I've been saved. (laughs) Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you that for any one of us who's a believer, we get to put our hand on our heart right now and say, this is the truth. It is by grace that I have been saved. No question about it. It is by grace that I've been saved. It is by grace that I've been saved. You can say it one more time while we're praying. Say it. It is by grace that I've been saved. Thank you, Jesus, for that grace. And and while we're praying, God, I pray for your spiritual awakening to happen for uh, someone in this moment, in, in this gathering, on the patio, in this room, at home. God, in this very moment, I pray for a spiritual awakening. And I'm I'm praying for you in particular if you're saying, I don't know if that applies to me. What you just said about it is by grace I've been saved. I don't know if I'm saved. I want you to know that you're saved. And the way that you can be saved is by once and for all just turning to Jesus Christ to say, Jesus, I put my trust in you and I believe in you and I believe that you've given your life so that I can really live, live forgiven, live free, live in your grace. And I'm asking for your forgiveness now. This kind of a moment is personal. I just described it, but for somebody listening to me right now, you need to have that moment personally, where once and for all, you would stop trying to earn something from God or prove something to God, and instead, Turn to Jesus, who's the only one who ever could fulfill what needed to be done, and simply say, Jesus, I give you my life, and he will give you his gift of salvation through his own grace, simply because you trusted in him by faith. And so while we're praying together, if you're sitting here going, I wish I could have that. I wish I could know that I'm right with God. I wish I could say that too, by grace I've been saved, all that stuff. It can happen for you in this very moment. And it's an opportunity right now for you to once and for all say, Jesus, would you forgive my sin and save my life? And if if you would like to do that, if you're sitting here saying, I need to do that, I want to ask Jesus Christ to forgive my sins and save my life, then right now, I want you to raise your hand with me. This is your moment to let it be personal once and for all to say, Jesus, would you forgive my sin and save my life? And I want you to raise it high and keep your hand up for a moment with me. Right here in the front, I see you. It's excellent. Thank you. Stay with me for a moment. Anyone else? I don't want to miss you. Just raise your hand. It's your way of finally saying, yes, I need the grace of God. I need his forgiveness. The back of my left. Thank you. There's a few of you. And in this moment, on my right over here in the middle, thank you. Yeah. Now you take this moment a little further, right here in the back, in the middle, a couple of, both of you. Those of you with your hand raised, our ministry team may make their way to you to give you a Bible, but right now, I want to ask everyone else to pause and you pray with me. And I want you to simply pray with me and simply say, Jesus Christ, I believe in you. That's the hinge. Everything turns there. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. Would you just say it to him with me? Say it. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. You can say it one more time stronger. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. I admit that I'm a sinner. I I need to ask you to forgive my sin. I turn from it. And Jesus, I turn to you. And And I turn my life over to you. And Jesus, I believe that you're alive, that you conquered death. And Jesus, would you come into my life and make me new? Just cry out to him, Jesus, would you make me new? Just 
in this moment, just say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. You can say it to him with me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And now every voice we get to say together, it is by grace that I've been saved. You can say it with me, everybody. It is by grace that I've been saved. One more time. It is by grace that I've been saved. Thank you, Jesus, for the grace that allows us to know we're forgiven, that we have a home in heaven forever, and that we get to walk through this world with you leading the way because you're Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you, Lord. I want you to stand up together, church. Stand up. Thank you, Lord. For some of us, we came today with a heaviness, and God wants to lift some heaviness from you. And you, you, some of you, what you need to do is when the service is done, come up front, and our ministry team is going to pray for you. Others of you, the way the heaviness is going to get lifted is you're going to go out into that patio and that circle, and you're going to see a purple sign with some connect group, and you're going you're gonna to actually go there. You're not going to just leave, and you're going to find some people. And being in community with some people, that's going to be where the lifting is going to happen for you. For others of you right now, if you would pay attention, Holy Spirit is lifting burdens even in this moment. Thank you, God, for your goodness to us. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock. The rock on which I stand, everything around me shakes. Hey, thanks for watching this week's message. I pray it has encouraged you and blessed you. And if you would like to connect with us here at Centerpoint, visit us on mycenterpoint.tv. And if you would like to partner with us financially, click that Give button. Also, uh, don't forget to hit subscribe if you want more videos like this. I pray you have a blessed day.